everyone. Oh, hi, Goose. You want to make an appearance? Oh, hello, sir. Are you aware that you are an internet micro celebrity? I think so. I think we are going to be talking about the affairs of Tigerwood, otherwise known as Tigergate, an incident that has weighed on me personally um, since I was about 11 or 12. Have I ever watched a golf event or had any interest in golf? No, I find it incredibly boring. Even the miniature form is on thin ice for me. And I'm honestly not even sure if I had heard of Tiger Woods before I heard of the Tiger Woods affair. And if I had heard of Tiger Woods as a kid, I'm sure my awareness of Tiger Woods was like the same way I was aware of taxes when I was like, 10 or 11. Like I knew that they existed, but I had no idea what sort of implications that would have on my life or like the nuances of what they do, you know? Very surface level understanding, if any. But somehow the fact that Tiger Woods had cheated on his wife devastated me. And I know I'm not the only one. Every once in a while while I'm scrolling on TikTok, I'll see a video like this. She's not a Christian! Ah! She could be a Jew and believe in it God. It doesn't matter. She, she's tampering it. And I'll think, huh, why did I care so much about Tiger Woods as a tween? But then I'll see a Whitney Houston meme and kind of forget that I had that question. Celebrity affairs are nothing new or unusual. But something about Tiger Gate drove the media into a frenzy that will be remembered well beyond the scandal dying down. And to understand the fallout from this scandal, we of course need to examine the world of golf, much to my chagrin, and of course the perception of Tiger before the scandal. Part one, the rise of Tiger. Tiger Woods, or Eldrick Taunt Woods, was born in December of 1975 to Earl and Tita Woods. Earl was a retired Vietnam vet, and he had met Tita while he was stationed in Thailand um, in his tour in 1968. Like his son, Earl was a lifelong athlete. He was a skilled golfer and was one of the first black athletes to play college baseball at Kansas State University. But from the moment Tiger was born, Earl had the intent on making his son a prodigy golfer. Even when Tiger was an infant, Earl would place Tiger in a high chair in the garage and just have him watch Earl constantly hit balls into a net. By age two, Tiger himself was practicing swings, which landed him in Earl an early appearance on The Mike Douglas Show with Bob Hope. At age five, he was featured in Golf Digest, and at age eight, he won his first formal competition. Earl has said that as a parent, he would have supported Tiger in whatever interest it happened to be, and in this case, it happened to be golf. What we do is we participate with him in golf, and if it was bowling, we would participate with him in bowling. And each and every one of us has our own life to live, and he has a choice. But. Others who knew Tiger and Earl while Tiger was growing up dispute that. One of Tiger's teachers said that when Tiger Express wanted to play other sports and the teacher passed that message along to his parents, Earl was furious and said that any other hobbies would distract Tiger from his pursuit of golf. As I mentioned before, Earl was a former military man and he used a lot of military tactics really to model Tiger into what he deemed the perfect athlete. Of course, Tiger would have long practice sessions, but Earl would also try to purposely agitate Tiger. He would step in front of him during his swings. He would loudly talk while Tiger was focusing. The goal was to train Tiger to be able to maintain his composure and stay focused on the golf, no matter what circumstances around him were happening. And I mean, this strategy worked. People who knew Tiger growing up could see Tiger go into what seemed to be like an actual trance while he was playing golf. And by age 11, he was able to beat his father in a round of golf for the first time. And Earl was not the only ones who had tight reins on Tiger. In fact, Tiger would often say that while him and his dad were more like friends, it was his mother who demanded strict obedience from her son. My mom was the enforcer. My dad may have been in the special forces, but I was never afraid of him. My mom's still here and I'm deathly afraid of her. She's a very tough, tough old lady, very demanding. She was the hand, she was the one. I love her so much, but she was tough. She would also tell Tiger in sport, you have to go for the throat because if all friendly, they come back and beat your ass. So you kill them, take their heart. So neither of Tiger's parents were messing around. Tiger's parents also exercised a lot of control over Tiger's personal life. One time when Tiger was on break from college, he lied and said that he was coming back the next day when in actuality, he was already back in his hometown, but was spending the night with his girlfriend. This was at the time his high school sweetheart, Dina. And according to Dina, when his parents found out that this has happened, they were irate. And the day after, Dina got a letter from Tiger basically saying that he no longer wished to see her and that was the last time they spoke. And according to Dina, Tiger's parents were never a big fan of her. I felt like their plans were creating this robot. There was all this preparation for golf, which is great. 
you're going to be a great golfer, but he had no life skills. He had not been prepared for life. And I was probably the only person around him that really kept him in check. And I would tell him, you're gonna wanna get married and have kids and golf is not gonna be the most important thing. You're gonna have to find that balance. And despite outward appearances, Earl was not always the best role model for Tiger either. Dina described one time where Tiger called her distraught. His father had been having an affair with a woman right in front of Tiger. He finally caught his breath and said, my dad's out again. He met this girl and they're going out. The sound of Tiger's voice was so upsetting. And his dad, I don't think he really cared that he knew it. I think that also bothered him. Like, why would you not try to hide that from me? Why would you just let me see this? And one of Tiger's family friends, who described himself basically as another father figure to Tiger, has also admitted to openly having affairs in front of Tiger. And Tiger was at the course, you know, and I was just every bit as bad. For a long time, me and Earl were the two biggest male figures in his life, the two closest to him, and here I am, chasing skirts and bringing them to the course, and he's seeing this. And I was married too at the time, and he's seeing this. To have that kind of access to this child's development and to expose him to that, I mean, yeah. Sorry, champ. Sorry. Now, this information wasn't known to the public and wouldn't really be revealed until after the scandal, but the journalist Tom Callahan described Earl as a notorious womanizer in his 2010 book. According to him, any woman who came within 50 feet of Earl was a potential plaintiff. Even though Tiger's parents were, at the best of times, uh, pretty intense, they were his biggest sources of moral support. The family would always be in attendance at Tiger's tournaments, and his bonds with his family were a major part of his brand as he rose in the golf world. In 1994, Tiger became the youngest U.S. amateur, a record he would keep until 2008. Tiger then briefly attended Stanford University on a full scholarship, of course, to play golf. But even before he turned pro, he was often the target of racial slurs, and discrimination. Tiger's parents have a mixed ancestry, which has been a topic of interest well before Tiger's affair was known to the world. According to ESPN, Tiger was one quarter Thai, one quarter Chinese, one quarter Caucasian, one eighth African American, and one eighth Native American. So while Tiger was in college, he coined the term cablination to describe his ethnicity. It was supposed to be a combination of Caucasian, Black, American Indian, and Asian. And although interracial marriage and just people existing with mixed ethnicities had certainly been on the rise. Growing up and early in his career, the fact that people couldn't necessarily put Tiger into one particular box made it so that he wasn't really accepted within one community. And even so, of course, the world at large saw him as a black man, and he was well aware of that. Just on Tiger's first day of kindergarten, he was attacked by a group of sixth graders who tied him to a tree, threw rocks at him, and spray painted the N-word above him. At a 1995 press conference for Stanford, Tiger said, people get the stereotype that racism is in the South. That's BS. It's everywhere. And at that same conference, he he revealed that he had already received letters from anonymous sources saying that n-words don't belong in golf. And for clarity, I'm censoring myself because I don't think we need to keep repeating the word, but full disclosure, these people obviously were not censoring themselves when they were saying this. And even when people weren't being openly discriminatory, it was not uncommon for sports commentators especially to refer to black athletes as naturally strong or gifted, whereas white athletes were more likely to be described as hardworking. In the year 2000s, one sports writer suggested that Tiger's golf skills were actually a combination of the muscularity and masculine charisma of the African-American superstar with the self-discipline and focus of the finest Asian-American athlete. Even Jack Nicklaus, who was considered to be the best golfer before Tiger came into the game in 1994, said that blacks have different muscles that react in different ways. Well, sure, Tiger may have been gifted to some natural degree. He certainly has an athletic build. It is also so undisputed just how hard he worked since the age of two to get where he is in his career. And on top of that, before he came into the golf world, pro golfers would be smoking cigars and drinking beer in between tees. You know, it wasn't necessarily viewed as an athletic endeavor. And he was someone who really put a lot of thought into his exercise regime, his diet, and focusing on building muscle mass. But often people would attribute his strength and muscles to his fast twitch muscle fibers rather than the fact that he had a very particular and very intentional fitness regime. But beyond his physical strength, what truly set Tiger apart was like his mental toughness that Earl had placed in him. You know, unlike many of his contemporaries who would pose with fans or be seen laughing with other competitors, Tiger had this sort of silent, unwavering focus. And in situations where a lot of other players would get into their heads, Tiger seemed unwavering in his composure. And this had an impact on the other people who were competing against them, so much so that in a 2009 study, researchers found that pros would average 48 strokes worse competing against Tiger. You know, Tiger's demeanor and sheer skill was intimidating even for people who had been in the game 
long before him. And at age 20 in 1996, he became the first golfer to win three consecutive US amateur titles and won the NCAA Individual Golf Championship. So after just two years in college, he left to become a pro with a $40 million endorsement deal from Nike. And for the next 13 years, his success in golf was really like unmatched. Just in that time frame alone, he won 70 PGA tournaments, 14 masters, and spent most of that time ranked as the number one player in the world. Interest in golf in that time also skyrocketed. The prize money for Tiger's first masters was just 70 million um, and jumped to 280 million in just a decade. And for Earl, he saw Tiger's accomplishments as having a reach far beyond um, the world of golf or even the world of sports. Tiger will do more than any other man in history to change the course of humanity. I don't know exactly what form this will take, but he is the chosen one. He'll have the power to impact nations, not people, nations. The world is just getting a taste of his power. To be clear, Earl was not the only one pushing Tiger as the great social equalizer. I'm the only man to win the executive US amateur titles. There's still courses in the US I'm not allowed to play because of the color. This ad was met with quite a lot of criticism, probably to the surprise of Nike. Critics disliked the political commentary and pointed out that no golf course would actually bar Tiger Woods from competing. But Nike responded that their intent in this ad was just to point out that golf was not an inclusive sport. Even so, they tried not to make overt political commentary in their subsequent ads. And to be clear, this ad wasn't just disliked by people who thinks that racism died in America years and years and years ago. Others saw it as sort of a tacky commercialization of like racial issues. And to some black Americans, the ad came off particularly insincere because Tiger Woods has often been placed as sort of a mouthpiece for the black community. And Tiger has never denied that he's a black man. Uh, when he won his first masters, he said his victory was vindication for all the great African-American players who never got to play there. But while our interviewing with Oprah, he referenced his Cablin Asian identity and said that he didn't necessarily like being referred to as a black person, even though that's how the world sees him, because saying that he's African American in effect denies his Asian heritage and saying that he's Asian in effect denies his black heritage. Funny thing is, growing up, I came up with his name, I'm a Cablin Asian. When you're called one or the other, does it bother you to be called African American? Yeah, it does, because I, to be honest with you, if I would have to label myself as anything um, ethnic wise, you know, I had to, always had to check a box, you know, in mm -hmm. those little forms and stuff. And they say, pick one. I can't. I usually pick African-American Asian because those are the two households I was raised under. And, you know, this statement was pretty universally mocked, so much so that Tiger really rarely mentioned his race from that point on in his career. When Tiger won his master's in 1997, per tradition, he was supposed to pick out the menu that would follow in the celebratory banquet. And another former golf champion, Zoller, jokingly told reporters to tell the little kid not to serve fried chickens or collard green or whatever the hell they serve. And even though this joke was rightfully met with the criticism, Tiger himself also got criticism for not immediately coming forward and saying that he forgives Zoller for, you know, being racist. In 2008, when a sports commentator joked that younger players should lynch Woods in a back alley, Tiger said that the comments were a non-issue and that he knew that the statements were not made with ill intent. Whether he said something about race or didn't say something about race, regardless of who it was coming from, Tiger was bound to get criticism. And for some, Tiger's failure to speak on a lot of the blatant racism that's in the golf world and that he himself had encountered was emblematic of his privilege and his potentially distancing himself from the black community. When we look at athletes like Colin Kaepernick or John Powers, black athletes who use their platforms to advocate for black issues, these athletes lost career opportunities, we're told not to speak about their race. And so whether we agree with Tiger's logic, I think in Tiger's mind it seemed more beneficial in the long run for his career to sort of take the Michael Jordan approach and remain neutral on the topic of race. And to those who viewed the 1990s in America as some sort of colorblind utopia, Tiger Woods was the perfect poster child. See, society doesn't have a race problem. Look at this one black guy who was super successful. And for some, this also validated their worldview that the only thing separating black Americans from white Americans wasn't systemic racism, 
it was laziness. For them, Tiger had overcome and was proof that racism was over in America. Speaking of racism, part two, golf. Despite my personal disinterest in golf, I do think understanding the culture of it is another key factor in the stardom and downfall of Tiger. The US has more than 17,000 golf courses, which when combined roughly equal the size of Rhode Island and Delaware. More than 20 million Americans play golf, and the golf industry employs over half a million. And despite being, of course, a sport of Scottish origin, golf is heavily tied to capitalist American ideals. Rush Limbaugh described golfers as the ultimate free market entrepreneurs. The sport is entirely about individual performance, and perhaps that is an apt metaphor, maybe not in the way that Rush Limbaugh would have intended it. You know, while there are affordable courses and golf clubs can be purchased secondhand. Quality equipment and club memberships and training can be quite expensive. The dress code and the air of importance attached to the sport furthers the notion that this is a rich man's game. Sure, anybody can play, but there's certainly a high barrier to entry for a lot of people. And of course, golf isn't all bad either. It has one of the oldest and most lucrative female leagues. Following the Industrial Revolution, the sport was seen as a great opportunity for people to gather outdoors, albeit a pretty artificial outdoors. And even though it's an individual sport, there's a lot of downtime where people can socialize and bond. And the sport is one with a heavy emphasis on sportsmanship and honor. It's the only sport where the person actually playing is supposed to penalize themselves when they break the rules. For example, in 1925 at the US Open, Bobby Jones gave himself a two point penalty because he moved the ball a fraction of an inch, something that only he saw. And doing that cost him the championship. But of course, the sport also has a long history of racism and misogyny. Prior to desegregation, black men would often work as caddies on the course. If they worked long enough, they would would often get the chance to learn to play themselves. However, the invention of the golf cart cut out many of these opportunities. Golf was also the last major sport to desegregate with a white only league leading up until 1971. Augusta, the host of the major US Masters tournament, would not invite their so-called dark colored friends until 1975. And in actuality, it wasn't until 1991 that they invited the first black member. The first women's member wasn't invited until 2012. Tiger being the first black man to win one of the four major golf titles in 1995 and being the most recognized competitor in a sport that had been thought of as a white man's game was a big deal. With their new champion, golf organizations could market the sport to a much wider audience and could distance themselves from their own histories of discrimination. Part three, the affairs. Tiger first met the woman who would become his wife, Elin Nordigan, in 2001 at the British Open. Elin was born and raised in Sweden and had been working as a model before she was offered a position of a nanny for another pro golfer in America. So she took the opportunity to save up for college and get a new life in the States. Elin has very rarely given interviews and is generally considered to be a very private person. And in fact, when Tiger initially asked her out, it said that she said no because she was hesitant in getting involved in sort of the world of celebrity. But regardless, they did start dating and were engaged in 2003. Tiger's former golf caddy said that he knew Tiger was serious when he asked that he actually pronounce Elon's name correctly. I don't know if that says more about Tiger or more about this guy, Steve Williams, I believe. And really, beyond concerns that Tiger's marriage would potentially impact his golf career, God forbid, the public loved Tiger and Eland. The two had two children, dogs, and they really seemed to be the perfect family. Interestingly enough, the only footage I lost from yesterday was when I actually started talking about the affair and like my basic theories about it. Did Tiger's legal team get into my computer and delete the footage? Or did I forget to press record during that part? Honestly, equally possible. So don't mind me wearing different clothes and it being completely different lighting for like the next 10 minutes. Of course, what the public in Elon didn't know is that Tiger had been having multiple affairs throughout the marriage. The National Enquirer had actually seen Tiger meeting up with a woman in a parking lot in 2007, but their evidence for it was kind of blurry, and so they were willing to negotiate a deal with Tiger where, in exchange for quieting the story, he would appear on their sister magazine, Men's Fitness. But in 2009, the National Enquirer again observed Tiger having an affair, this time with a woman named Rachel Ucatel, and this time they had definitive evidence. There was no way Tiger was going to be able to bury the story. And so according to Rachel, Tiger had Rachel get on the phone with Elon before the story was to be released so that Rachel could convince Elon that they weren't having an affair. And apparently this kind of worked, but then Tiger and Rachel were talking on the phone later and Tiger was like, okay, I gotta go. And then a little bit later, Rachel answered a phone call from Tiger's phone. And when she was like, 
Hey, Tiger, thought you went to bed. It was Elin on the other line, so yeah, the, the jig was up. And even though the National Enquirer went forward with the story, the mainstream media didn't actually really pick up on this for another two days, when Tiger Woods crashed his car in front of his Florida mansion at 2 a.m. on Thanksgiving Day. And of course, people were panicked over Tiger's accident, whether he was seriously injured, but then many people began to pick up on sort of the weird circumstances of this accident. Why would Tiger be driving from his home at 2 a.m. on a holiday? And hey, didn't the National Enquirer just release a story on how he was supposedly having an affair? So people naturally speculated that the accident was actually a result of a dispute between Elon and Tiger over the affair. Another detail that would be hotly debated was that after Tiger crashed his vehicle, Elon used a golf club to break the back two windows of the cars so that she could get him out of the vehicle. But people took that story and said that Elon had actually been chasing Tiger out of his home with the golf club and that's what caused the crash. Elon and Tiger have always disputed this and I understand, neither of them are particularly reliable narrators. But I do have to say that if someone has just crashed their car in front of you, you don't wanna break the windows in the front because then the glass will go shattering all over the person's unconscious body. You would want to break the windows in the back, reach over, unlock the door, and then get the person out that way. And whether people believed that Elon had chased Tiger or not, um, this became a pretty popular joke following the scandal. And Tiger's team tried to stop the damage from this story and published to his website that he denied these false and unfounded malicious rumors. But the press soon found out that Rachel Ucatel had been paid a million dollars to sign an NDA. And the Wall Street Journal also reported on that earlier 2007 incident where the National Enquirer had bargained for their silence. And in the days that followed, multiple women would come forward with text messages, voicemails, like indisputable evidence that they were having an affair. And interestingly, they weren't just appearing to have like physical affairs with Tiger. He would be talking about his childhood trauma, his problems with fame, proof that men will do anything besides go to therapy sometimes. The story was unstoppable and Tiger would give a press conference three months after the accident, publicly apologizing for these acts and admitting that he would be seeking treatment for sex addiction. I am deeply sorry for my irresponsible and selfish behavior I engaged in. Elon and I have started the process of discussing the damage caused by my behavior. As Elin pointed out to me, my real apology to her will not come in the form of words. It will come from my behavior over time. To those of you who work for me, I have let you down personally and professionally. For all that I have done, I am so sorry. Some people have speculated that Elin somehow hurt or attacked me on Thanksgiving night. It angers me that people would fabricate a story like that. Elon never hit me that night or any other night. I brought the shame on myself. I hurt my wife, my kids, my mother, my wife's family, my friends, my foundation, and kids all around the world who admired me. It's hard to admit that I need help, but I do. For 45 days from the end of December to early February, I was in inpatient therapy, receiving guidance for the issues I'm facing. I have a long way to go, but I've taken my first steps in the right direction. As I proceed, I understand people have questions. I understand the press wants, me to, wants to ask me for the details of the times I was unfaithful. I understand people want to know whether Elon and I will remain together. Please know that as far as I'm concerned, Every one of these questions and answers is a matter between Elon and me. Also in 2010, the public became aware that Tiger and Earl had not had the perfect public relationship that they had come to believe. And like I mentioned earlier, they realized that Earl had also been an infamous womanizer. And Elon's silence during this time also continued speculation into her reaction. It was initially said that she would receive $750 million from their divorce settlement. And we don't note the actual numbers, but people say that it's actually closer to $100 million. And to top it all off, when he returned to golf, for the first time post-scandal at the 2010 Masters, Billy Payne, the chairman of the host club Augusta National, yes, that Augusta National, took the time to once again publicly call out Tiger Woods. It is not simply the degree of his conduct that is so egregious here. It is the fact that he disappointed all of us, and more importantly, our kids and our grandkids. Our hero did not live up to the expectations of the role model we sought for our children.
This action, for one, totally unprecedented. Plenty of famous golfers have had affairs. Hal Sutton got the nickname Halimony for his long trail of philandering and affairs. Sir Nick Faldo, who was in the documentary about Tiger's downfall and re-entrance back into golf, had an affair with one woman while he was married and then proceeded to marry his mistress and then, of course, had an affair in that second marriage as well. And then the second wife, the one who initially was the other woman, said that the three children they had had during their marriage all had to be induced because Nick Faldo didn't want the birth of his children to interrupt his golf schedule. Also, as previously discussed, this club was openly discriminatory for decades and did not have the moral high ground to call out Tiger Woods. Worst of all, Tiger got fourth at that year's Masters. So not only had he had affairs, he was less good at golf. And that we cannot stand. Plenty of golfers have had affairs. Plenty of people have had affairs. Numbers aren't exactly clear, but surveys estimate the range of like 30% to 60% of people have had a marital affair at some point. But the public was enamored with this one. And there's plenty of theories as to why that might be as it turns out. Part four, why we cared. Hypocrisy. Probably the biggest flaw a person can have in the eyes of the public is being a hypocrite. When someone brands themselves as a family man with a squeaky clean image, evidence that that public figure is actually a flawed human being can quickly turn the public against you. That's why when Rachel Hollis announced that she was getting divorced, people weren't upset because she was getting divorced. They were upset because just a few years prior, she had been selling marriage conference, which were based on the idea that her and her husband had a perfect marriage. You know, the rumors that Bryce Hall cheated on Addison Rae probably didn't have that big of an impact on his career because the public already doesn't think of Bryce Hall as a particularly morally upstanding citizen. And what also adds to this hypocrisy, of course, is the sport of golf. Even though I've mentioned before plenty of golfers have had affairs, Tiger had a kind of fame that very few golfers had. And unlike sports like football or basketball, golf is sort of given this reputation of being a sport for prim and proper people. It's a sport that emphasizes honesty and elitism, but a scandal like this points out that golf players are just as corruptible as anybody else. Celebrity. Tiger is estimated to be a billionaire and one of the richest and most successful athletes of all time. He helps sell video games, razors, and of course, Nike. Even though a celebrity fair doesn't realistically impact any of our daily lives, celebrities hold a lot of wealth, power, and influence in society. Evidence that that person might not actually be deserving of that power they have can motivate Hashtag cancel culture. Thank God cancel culture wasn't a popular term in 2009 because I can't imagine the amount of thing pieces I would have to read about Tiger being a victim of cancel culture. Really, it's a means of affecting democracy. We the people give certain people higher statuses in society and when they breach this sort of parasocial contract, public outrage is often the result. The hurting effect. Many economists and sociologists theorize that just like individuals, news organizations often plan the news that they will deliver based on what other media organizations are saying. If CNN is getting major ratings for discussing Tiger, other media organizations have an incentive to do so as well, regardless of whether they think um, Tigergate is some huge moral issue the public needs to know about. Additionally, a lot of news organizations do what I like to call exactly what I'm doing, except worse because it's them doing it and not me and I'm so cool and they are not me. Where instead of just writing about the trashy gossip like TMZ or the National Enquirer, New York Times or Newsweek can write a think piece like why we can't look away, understanding our craven celebrity culture, which still summarizes the juicy gossip, but can differentiate themselves from the trashy magazines because use big words and quote sociologists. Can't relate, how dare you, Newsweek. A similar, but personally much more annoying variation on this trend is when articles and commenters go, why does everyone care about Tiger Woods? Don't you know there's a war going on in Afghanistan? Everyone is dumb sheep, unlike me, big brain, who knows there's a war going on. And to that I say, I don't know, Phil, maybe people grew up with more of an understanding of Tiger and maybe the significance of a story as opposed to a war in a country they may know nothing about. Or maybe it's less stressful to think about a scandal that ultimately doesn't impact your life and isn't as heavy as, say, the deaths of thousands of people, American or otherwise. <laughs> maybe gossip is just a part of human nature and we've always cared about silly stuff that doesn't matter. I mean, the way founding fathers would run for office just so that they could print pamphlets about how they didn't like the other founding father running for office and how they were dumb and stupid. 
we've never been above discussing celebrity gossip. And this, of course, was also around the time that internet forums and social media were really taking off. I mean, countless memes were spreading about this via chain mail mocking the situation. Even people who didn't watch golf or cable news would get this in their inbox. Thanks, Aunt Gail. I really needed that. His sex addiction. Tiger revealing that he had been struggling with sex addiction was, uh, for many people, the first time that they had heard of this. And even though culturally we've wrapped our heads around things like drug and alcohol addiction, when it comes to other things like sex addiction or food addiction, I think the public is pretty split as to whether that's a real thing or not. And even if academics were to come out and say it's a 100% real thing, I think people would still debate whether it's actually a valid excuse. Because even though in Tiger's apology, he didn't blame anybody else for his actions, to some it felt like saying, oh, I'm just an addict was him saying, oh, I shouldn't be accountable for his behavior and came off as a lame excuse. So not only were people debating over whether this is actually a valid affliction, people were debating over whether that actually meant the tiger was genuinely sorry or not. And regardless, apparently still made for a half decent punchline. This is my least academic theory, but honestly the fact that Tiger Woods is just so easy to make like really low hanging puns about, I wonder if that contributed at all because the sheer number of times I had to read like the same three jokes, um, it's astounding. Tiger, more like cheetah, <laughs> am I right? Or looks like he got a hole in one. Or Tiger Woods, <laughs> like, like peen. Which, you know, another possibility. Tiger Woods had a predominantly male audience and celebrity gossip is often marketed to and consumed by women. You didn't have to be an expert in golf to get why this was a juicy story. But also, if you're an avid sports fan, you may be more invested in the downfall of like an esteemed athlete. I mean, would my partner know more about Trisha Paytas if the Buccaneers traded Tom Brady for her? I mean, it's possible. Also attempting to join the NFL, um, not out of the range of things I could see Trisha doing in the next couple of years. All right, next, misogyny. Yes, folks, we can't have a good video essay without bringing up this one. As someone who's read the comments on a lot of these old articles and YouTube videos, a not insignificant number of the comments are something along the lines of, poor Tiger, don't people know that it's in his DNA for him to cheat? All men do. He was biologically predisposed to do this, don't you know? Especially if his wife isn't satisfying him anymore. Not that that's what Tiger has said, but I'm sure that his wife wasn't satisfying him anymore. Not like me, Tiger. I would always treat you right. I mean, that's what I imagine they would say. They didn't say that last part. I mean, just look at this interview with another pro golfer, John Daly. What did you think of the sex scandal? I don't think it was near that many women. I don't want to speak for Tiger, but I know in the situation, if I was going to go out and cheat on somebody. The only reason why I would is because they quit having sex with me. And none of the comments point out that he just said that Tiger probably wouldn't have cheated if his wife had just stepped up to the plate a little bit more. And the mistresses didn't get off great either. Rachel Ucatel, um has struggled to find work even to this day. And one job she was able to find withheld over $60,000 in payment from her. I mean, you look up their names and you just see Tiger Woods affair. It's not hard to imagine why they might have a hard time finding employment. And so her only means of income seems to be subjecting herself to further public scrutiny, appearing in Tiger Woods documentaries and the like. And even now, Tiger's team is looking into suing Rachel for violating the NDA she signed all those years ago, even though at this point Rachel has declared bankruptcy. And I'm not saying these women are innocent or that Tiger didn't also get scrutiny, but it seems as though a not insignificant amount of people seem to think that these women were just temptresses leading poor Tiger astray, or if his wife hadn't just been some harpy chasing him with a golf club, maybe things would be different. And I don't know if that's the case. I also mentioned that Elon and Tiger got divorced and Elon has very rarely spoken to the press. She did give one People interview in 2010 and again in 2014. And you know, nothing she said is beyond what you would expect a woman who has had kids with a celebrity and very publicly had to deal with an affair and divorce has said. In 2010, when asked about her divorce settlement, she just said, money can't buy happiness or put my family back together. But the fact that Elon got a hundred million dollars in the divorce settlement was very upsetting to some who thought that she wasn't deserving of it or that she was just some gold digger. And this has been her plan for Tiger to have affairs from the beginning, I guess. Can anybody explain these divorce settlements? Can anybody make sense of these fucking things? Tiger Woods' wife, $250 million. She's a babysitter worth a quarter of a billion fucking dollars. Dude, there is an epidemic of gold digging whores in this country. 
If it's not obvious, I very much disagree with this sentiment. She had every right to leave, to be upset, to write a tell-all book if that's what she wants to do. And she definitely had a right to be compensated for what Tiger put her through. And if it makes these men feel any better, Tiger and Elin continue to have a cordial co-parenting relationship. Tiger is a billionaire. I don't doubt he had to spend a lot of money in the divorce and in these NDAs and dealing with sponsorships following the affairs, but you know, these are the consequences of his own actions, not Elon's. And he's doing just fine financially. Like, don't worry. <laughs> and finally, I'm sure you all saw this coming, racism. This was the Vanity Fair cover following the outbreak of Tiger Gate. And following the scandal, there was an uptick in racial slurs being directed at Tiger. Tiger's race had always been a spot of vulnerability, but now that Tiger's philandering somehow conformed to negative stereotypes people already had about black men, and they finally had proof that Tiger somehow never deserved this token spot that they had given them, it really just opened the floodgates of things it seemed that people had been holding back on saying for years. And of course, me saying this, I know that there's already someone furiously typing, how dare you pull the race card, this has nothing to do with race. And you know, plenty of people also said that at the time. Yes, white celebrities have had affairs that shook their career too. I think Bill Clinton is probably the most obvious example of that, and there are plenty of others. But I do wonder how many of those celebrities had racial slurs consistently directed at them. How many of them were placed in a shirtless pic and a hoodie with their skin darkened after the scandal. How many discussions of their size, which is tied to a lot of stereotypes about black men being savages and animals, brought up. You know, Tiger had previously been seen as kind of a dork, but now he was some hyper-masculine, dangerous black man that people apparently had feared this whole time. Of course, I can't say whether Tiger Gate would have erupted in the same way if he was a white man. You know, maybe, maybe it would have. But I do think people disputing whether his race was a factor furthered the scandal's reach because anytime someone would point out that race might be a factor, you would get that backlash of something, how dare you play the race card, race isn't a factor, and you know, created this never-ending cycle on the internet that could just continue for weeks and weeks on end. In my opinion, the racism he was subjected to before he had done anything wrong in the eyes of the public could only have gotten worse when people actually had a reason to vilify him. It could be one of these things, could be none of these things. And as for why it impacted me as a kid, it certainly could have been these reasons as well. But on top of that, when you're a kid, I feel like you have a pretty black and white moral compass and pretty limited understanding of like things that are good and bad. Like when Martha Stewart went to jail and was accused of insider trading, did that bother me? No, because I didn't know what stocks then. Frankly, I still don't know now and I'm too afraid to ask at this point. But on a surface level, I get a celebrity cheating on his wife is like a bad thing. Same with like when Britney shaved her head. That's a weird thing. And I mean, I had no idea about the events that led up to that one. And unfortunately, it seems as though my take as a seven-year-old was just as nuanced as the general public's. But especially if you were a kid who idolized Tiger, it must have been upsetting to see the whole world discussing your hero's downfall. I mean, my interest in, in this story didn't come from my passion for golf, but even now I can see that it's an incredibly human story where the more you look into it, the more rabbit holes you can find yourself going down. And Tiger Gate has has had a lasting impact on his image. In 2017, Tiger was arrested for driving under the influence. In the years prior, he had undergone multiple back surgeries and it's speculated that he may have developed a dependence on painkillers um, during his recovery. When he posted to social media footage of him practicing his swing again after getting sober, the comments were flooded with fans wishing for him to come back. And just when we thought Tiger's career was over, in 2019, Tiger won the Masters again, his first major title victory since 2008. Now, Tiger isn't just some child prodigy, he's an underdog. It may have taken, you know, a decade, but I think people are finally able to see Tiger as a human being. That is all for today, folks. Thank you again to Semper for partnering with me on this video. You can check them out by clicking the link in my description or in the pinned comment down below. And definitely let me know your thoughts down below if there are any other theories that you have. And by the time y'all are seeing this, I will have just finished taking the bar exam and will be on a Oh my god, much needed <laughs> vacation. So um, if you like this video, maybe like it, maybe hit subscribe, and hopefully in a couple months you will all have to refer to me as Ashley Norton Esquire. All right, folks, I'll see you on the next one. Bye.